Hello, everybody, and welcome to Question and Answer Time. I'm your host, Adam Neely. I'm here answering all of your questions about bass and music in general, so let's get started. So my last video on A equals 432 hertz got a wide range of reactions. I'd like to share some of the negative ones with you right now. Bullshit. Ear tuning by 430, approximate 432. It's clearly a math reference, basically because pitch isn't arbitrary. This boy is not getting the point of 432 hertz, and a big atheist vibe in him. It is by far more relaxing and more consonant. Our ears perceive the intervals more easily and can single out notes in the mind easier. He hasn't been very smart with these arguments, specifically when he criticizes people defend the theory through numbers, and then he himself dives through the numbers numbers the same way. Neither is he using his ears. Dude, you're horse shit. Don't talk about shit you don't understand and then call it new age bullshit. Everything is made up of resonance. There's no physical reality without resonance, and this resonance is in the form of sound, which also makes up the electromagnetic invisible light spectrum. The 8 hertz is the frequency in which all life works. So for these people, there's actually two things that I'd like to say. The first thing is that it's okay to think that 432 hertz sounds better than 440 hertz. It has a real emotional affect. Now, whether or not it's any different than, you know, A equals 400 and 20 hertz or 425 hertz or 445 hertz or literally anything else, well, yeah, it's different, but it's not objectively better or worse because pitch is arbitrary. And that's all the things that I was saying in that video. It's okay to think that 432 hertz is better, but that's a personal preference because once you get into the science of it and the mathematics of it, well, there really isn't any difference. Pitch is arbitrary. And that's very important to know because numerology is not the same thing as mathematics. Mathematicians really don't care about any sort of coincidences between numbers, especially if those numbers aren't an objective reflection of reality. There were some people that sent me documentaries about 432 hertz, insisting that if I watched them, my mind would be changed about it. And yeah, I mean, when I was researching that video, my past video on 432 hertz, I watched all of the documentaries and they're all complete crap. I don't feel like I really needed to do a line by line debunking of every theory there is about 432 hertz, like for example, example, the Nazis invented 440 to uh, somehow control the masses. That's completely not true. The Stuttgart pitch was 440 and it was set in the 19th century. And yeah, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things. And I've actually linked a couple more debunking links in the description in case you're at all interested about a line by line debunking of everything. I do understand where a lot of the people who are obsessed with this 432 hertz thing are coming from because they have a spiritual relationship to music and want to have some sort of scientific or mathematical validation to their relationship to music and music making. But to me, it feels lazy because you're not going into the study of any of this stuff with any degree of rigor. The nuts and bolts, the technical details of theory and math don't always look so pretty when you view them up close. And so it requires a much broader and deeper understanding of the material that you're working with in order to have a little bit more of a holistic viewpoint of the whole thing. Without this rigorous study, if you start making broad statements about sacred vibrational geometry and the geometry of math and the harmony of the spheres, it means nothing. Now, when Paul Hindemith writes a piece of music called Harmony of the Spheres based upon Kepler's work about the rotations of the orbits of planets around the sun and the harmonic ratios between them and all that good stuff. You know, he's earned that right because he's walked the walk as a composer and he spent his entire lifetime working in the nitty gritty of musical composition. That sort of grandiose ambition to describe things in this sort of wide ranging holistic viewpoint kind of has to be earned in order to feel right. And almost everything that I've ever read about 432 hertz is just isn't earned because, well, there's really nothing behind it. So anyway, I apologize about this rant. I kind of, you know, had a lot of stuff to say. So uh, yeah, let's uh, get on to some more questions. Bloodbath and Beyond writes, Neither clip sounded better because fuck Smash Mouth. Well, what song would you have preferred me to use? You see, the thing about All Star is that, yeah, it's funny, it's a meme, and I use it all the time for that, but it's also a really useful tool for teaching music because it's a simple diatonic melody that's interesting and also is incredibly malleable in a wide variety of musical concepts. So from like a teaching standpoint, All Star is great. I love using All Star in my videos, even though it's a dead meme, but whatever, I'm gonna continue using it. So uh, yeah, 
Get used to it. Tiago da Silva writes, We need to stop using the term sound guy, like your story of the sound guy telling a woman how to set up her equipment. I myself am a sound engineer, which admittedly is also a very male-dominated field. But I know of some outstanding women engineers, and the term sound guy is antiquated as actress, policeman, and all those other gender-implying categorizations. I'm glad that you brought that up, because I was definitely using the term sound guy deliberately. Female sound engineers were not going to be particularly likely to talk down to female musicians and assume that they don't know how to set up their own gear just because they're women. Now, if the term sound guy is too gendered for you, you could say side person. And if that's too PC for you, you could say sound engineer. And basically everybody's happy because that's a great term to describe any kind of person who works in sound. There are a few words in music to describe occupations within music that are a little bit more gendered and harder to replace. For example, the word sideman. The term sideman has a very particular sort of loaded meaning, at least in the circles that I run in. And, you know, I know a lot of female colleagues who will say things like, hey, you know, I've been taking a lot of sideman gigs recently. Recently. Side woman and side person, I guess, work, but for whatever reason, in my experience, they just don't have the same sort of colloquial usage. Maybe that will change, but for right now, side man seems to be, you know, the word that everybody uses. You know, gendered language is really interesting because when we're trying to be more inclusive and say things like sound woman or whatever, the particular sort of feeling associated with sound guy is kind of lost in translation because sound guy has a very particular, I don't know, feeling to it. And that's okay. It's okay to lose things in translation, but it's just something to be aware of. And that's something that I've noticed uh, more and more recently. So yeah, cool. Thanks for your comment. The Mass Drummer writes, you've misunderstood this beautiful music. This is not Vaporwave. I've been getting a lot more of these comments on my Music Theory of Vaporwave video from essentially Vaporwave purists. And to me, that's really funny because wasn't Vaporwave supposed to be this Dadaist art slash music movement? Wasn't it supposed to be this ridiculous thing full of memes and 80s and 90s culture and just this weird explosion of nostalgia drenched weirdness? You know, that sort of thing has been changing because there seems to be more and more people who are really guarded about what Vaporwave should be. And you know, it didn't really start with any sort of purist tradition, so why would you say that? Now, there are great artists definitely making Vaporwave and expanding the sonic palette and doing some really cool things, but that's, I don't think, what these comments are referencing. So, I don't know, the Vaporwave purist sort of movement, nascent as it may be, is really uh, <laughs> strange and ridiculous to me. The Scowling Schnauzer writes, I think New York City has a chance of hitting the jackpot getting noticed and offered record deal, slash getting into an established live performance ensemble, and crumbs to get by on, you can always play the subway. When I live in Pittsburgh, there are a few opportunities to busk that are as accessible as the New York City subway. New York City artists agree and disagree, and why? So, first of all, don't ever think about getting noticed and getting a record deal as, quote, making it. That doesn't really happen and doesn't really exist in the same way that you might think it does, or at least that has been romanticized in popular culture. That ship has sailed a long time ago. And even if it did happen, and even if all of your wildest dreams about music came true, it would not happen in New York City, it would happen in LA. That's where most of the music industry is. Now, weirdly, music industry does not equal musicians, and so all the industry is out in LA, but a lot of the musicians are in New York. And so what that means is, yes, there are a lot of performance opportunities here in New York City that, you know, you might not have necessarily in a place like Pittsburgh. But in order to do that, you really have to abandon the idea that you'll somehow get picked up and get a record deal and all of that because that sort of mindset is quite counterproductive in order to have the right sort of idea about what your place is in New York City and the world as a musician. Nobody is going to give you anything. You have to make your own opportunity and your own career. Benjamin Stedman writes, Hi Adam, what is your opinion on talent? Personally, I can't stand some people have it and some people don't mindset that some people hold for music, but I'd be interested in hear your thoughts on this, the whole nature versus nurture idea applied to music and whether there is some kind of factor limiting how good a musician a person can become that is described as talent. So when you see somebody who is really skilled at what they do, do that thing, you can only see the result of all the hours of hard work. So if somebody is singing something really crazy and impressive or playing some really awesome guitar line, all you're seeing and all you're experiencing is the end result of that. And for people with no frame of reference for how many hours and how much work that actually goes into that end result, it might 
give the impression of natural talent. Now, I think talent might exist, but it's only purely in terms of a person's relationship to the work that they're going to do in order to acquire a skill. So a person might be talented on focusing and also selecting the right sorts of things to work on in order to better themselves at a particular thing, like, you know, playing music. Beyond that, however, I definitely do not see anybody's ability to achieve something hampered by a so-called lack of talent. It's just purely how much work you are able to put in to the thing that you are going to do. M3Z4C writes, EU government support for the arts, lol. There's only money for classical musicians and they basically get enough money to buy a cup of coffee. First of all, I know that that's not true because I do have musician friends in France and in Belgium who use government support, uh, whether it's grants or supported programs or other things in order to make a living. But more importantly, as an EU citizen, you probably shouldn't be complaining about public support for the arts to an American where we have literally none. Literally none. We just have the capitalist free market to survive. And, you know, we kind of have to reckon with that. And that's a big part of being a musician in the United States. Now, maybe this is an argument for capitalism, or maybe it's an argument against, but, you know, the high level of musicianship in the United States, or at least in places like New York or whatever, is almost kind of proof that the free market works. I guess, like, the quality of life is so much lower, but the quality of musician is really high. I guess there's like a give and take in that. Hi Guitar One writes, regarding musician trying to make it in a non-musician's world, I was wondering if you ever feel like your crazy jazz-based, non-diatonic ideas seemed crazy good and interesting when you came up with it, but when you did your best to produce it and blend it all together, it sounded flat relative to quote, normal music. Any way with coping with this? Is it mainly just bumping up with the production game? Yeah, you have stumbled upon one of the big challenges for people who are into jazz or progressive music or anything with like a million chords and chord progressions and odd time signatures and all the fancy stuff. And that thing is that music production at the end of the day, when you're talking about sound recordings is probably the most important thing. All the time you've been studying Lydian dominant scales, people who have been making quote, simpler music have been studying, well, how to get the right sort of kick drum sound and snare drum sound. That ultimately, I think, is a more effective means of conveying musical emotion and expression through sound record. So yeah, definitely get started with studying music production and understanding the differences between 90 hertz and 180 hertz and why you might want to boost one versus the other on certain instruments. The Bolon writes, Hello Adam, thanks for the videos. Question about the New York scene. I had an impression there were a lot of great musicians because it's a super important city, not because there are a lot of opportunities per se. With some of your gigs vlogs, it seems like there's an actual abundance of smaller underground gigs, but I thought it being New York, money, 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 musicians would rely on really, really tight budget. But now it doesn't seem so much like that, though of course you're a stellar musician, I imagine, blah, 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 blah. Can you touch on that? That's a good question, and I do want to talk a little bit about this, because the kinds of gigs that I feature on my gig vlogs well, I don't really rely upon them for money per se. I mean, there are exceptions like the weddings and like the cocktail hours and like some of those sorts of corporate function things where I'm pretty much just doing it for the money. But uh, for the most part, I'm doing it because of, hey, the love of music. I mean, I definitely do get paid, but it's almost always out of pocket by the artists. And, you know, the artists can't really afford to pay a whole lot of money, pay what I'm worth, honestly. And so I do it because, hey, I support this person and I like what the kind of music that they're making and I want to be a side man in their band. Now, it's not like I'm part of a band. I'm definitely a side person hired by an artist who has written a bunch of original music that wants me to realize that music for them in a venue. This is the sort of gig that you will get when you first move to New York City, and you're going to be getting these gigs from people who have to pay out of pocket. They themselves will not be making any money on these gigs. They'll be taking a huge loss, but they're wanting to do it because apparently that's what you do in New York City. You play out your original music. And that's kind of almost the sad thing about the economics of a struggling musician. You kind of have to rely upon the money of other musicians in order to make a living as a musician yourself. So most people quickly realize that that is not a sustainable model and definitely get side gigs and, you know, start teaching and doing other sorts of things rather than, you know, doing these original gigs playing at places like The Bitter End or Rockwood or Arlene's Grocery, or I don't know, any of these venues on the Lower East Side. Eventually, you might start playing with people who have a little bit more of a budget for one reason or another, and then you can start getting paid more and more as a sideman from the artists themselves. This is cool, and for a lot of people, they really enjoy this sort of sideman work where they're able to make a living just performing. Honestly, they're gonna kinda have to struggle for it when you're based in New York City, but you know, it is possible. For me, I took a slightly different route, and I started teaching and also doing a lot of weddings and corporate gigs, and that was my main means of supporting myself. 
myself. I was able to take original music gigs that paid a lot less, but you know, I really believed in the music that people were making. Because I did that, I get to play with really amazing musicians all the time and get to play music that I enjoy playing, even if it doesn't necessarily pay that great. It really comes down to priorities. If you're going to be very mercenary and go for every sort of sideman gig and try and really piece together a career that way, it is possible. With the gig vlogs, I'm trying to show you a small slice of what it's like to perform these gigs and other sorts of things and just give you a wide understanding of what it's like to be a musician performing in New York City. Kev's music and stuff, right? I'm just finished my BA, and I was wondering if it's worth me doing my master's. Will it actually help me get a job slash make more money? So I've been referring to my master's degree as my piece of paper, because honestly, that's all it is in terms of its ability to get me jobs and further my career. And, you know, and because I've referred to it as a piece of paper, people in the comment sections have chastised me saying things like, I am demeaning the amount of work that goes into getting such a prestigious academic degree and blah, blah, blah. But you know, honestly, the amount of work that I had to do in order to get a master's degree, which was quite considerable, I worked very hard to get it, isn't half as hard as, you know, you're going to have to work in order to create a sustainable career in music. And that master's degree is not really going to help you at all unless you want to get like a university teaching position, which at some point I might, because a lot of people say, hey, you should be a professor. And my response is, hey, who's hiring? Because it's very hard to get a professorship and that master's degree might come in handy later. But beyond getting a professorship at a university, there is no use to getting a master's degree. Now that said, there's definitely something to the idea of putting a bunch of ridiculously talented musicians in the same place, hungry for musical knowledge, for musical knowledge's sake. Learning for learning's sake and to be a better musician and ostensibly a better human being is a pretty awesome thing that I believe in. And it's the reason why I also have this YouTube channel because you know my hunger for knowledge, which was fueled from a young age, has led me to the place where I can talk about a variety of subjects here on YouTube. Not to say that getting a master's will automatically give you that outlet, but think a little bit deeper about what learning is and try not to always equate like, if I get a master's, I'm gonna get this job. That's not how it works in this field. That's not how it works in any sort of creative field. You have to think a little bit bigger. Marco Parala writes, I have a question, hope you read these comments, in place where I live. There is only one really important thing you need to get before becoming a musician. And I mean driver's license. It is a real pain in the ass if you are in a band with no one has a driver's license. Secondly, car. We need to have car. Transportation sucks, and it sucks to organize how bound will travel and so on. So do you have car or driver's license? How do you feel about my argument? Do you need these in New York? Yeah, it can be quite a hassle to figure out all of the steps necessary in order to, you know, transport yourself or transport your band or transport your equipment from, you know, your home to the gig and back again. In New York City, it's doubly as bad for certain sorts of gigs because having a car itself is a hassle. It makes very little sense in a lot of situations because having public transportation available is actually a lot more convenient and finding places to park the car and like driving through traffic is very inconvenient. So a lot of people just simply do not own cars. Now we do have the option of renting cars and that can be very, very useful. You can have things like Zipcar, except it's a little bit more expensive on the weekends. But if you wanna save a lot of money and just be as savvy as you possibly can be, I'm gonna give you a life pro tip with which I uh, haven't seen anywhere else on the internet, so pay attention. If you are living in New York City and you need to rent a car, do not rent a car in New York City. It is extremely expensive. Instead, take the bus from Penn Station or take the PATH train across the East River to Hoboken or Jersey City or any place in New Jersey because it is about like three times less expensive to rent a car in Jersey than in New York City. So uh, yeah. Do that if you are living in New York City and you need to transport equipment. Anna Turinen writes, Hi Adam, keep up the good stuff. I have a question about locking in with a drummer. Do you think that if a bass player and the drummer both have good time feel, they'll lock in automatically, or is there more into it? What a bassist could or should do to make locking in easier? Thanks. So yeah, having good time is essential, and that will definitely solve most of the issues. Just being able to play a line steady and convincingly without the drummer so that when a good drummer with good time comes in, you can play equally as steady time with them. There's more to it than that, and a lot of it comes down to how you conceptualize your bass line in relationship to what the drummer is playing. 
Making sure that you lock in with the kick drum is absolutely essential, but beyond locking in with the kick drum, you should also know when to cut off your note in relationship to other things like the snare drum. But even that is just one concept of how a bass will relate to a drum set. So a good thing is to make sure that you listen to a wide variety of rhythm sections and pay close attention to how the bass player is controlling and cutting off every note that they play. It's one thing to play in time with your attacks, but it's also important to know that your releases, when you stop the sound, when the note actually stops ringing out is almost equally as important to getting the feeling of being locked in with a drummer. And even still, once you've figured all of that stuff out, you need to make sure that your drummer and yourself are phase locked because both of you could have really good time and really consistent time, like the drum is always hitting exactly here in relationship to the beat every single time, and your bass is always hitting here in relationship to the beat every single time. But if they're at slightly different times, it's gonna feel a little bit disjoint for most styles of music. For certain kinds of music, it might be okay, but you know, it, it needs to be like a little bit more of a, an agreement of where time needs to be. Good time is one part of the puzzle. Good metronomic time is like a baseline, no pun intended, or maybe it's kind of a pun intended, let's say it's a pun intended, for having a good tight rhythm section, but there's a lot more to it than that. So great question, and I, I do wanna make a video about this at some point in the future, because uh, yeah, a good rhythm section and feeling locked in with a drummer is one of the best feelings that I have ever felt as a musician. And you know, I get to work with really awesome drummers all the time, each of which has a very different sort of time feel. And I have to know how to lock in with them. And you know, it's a different sort of vibe, a different sort of chemistry for every sort of drummer that I play with. And I think that's a really exciting, interesting thing because it's like having a different sort of conversation with another person. And you know, the, the relationship between a bass player and a drummer is one of the more intimate relationships, musical relationships that you can have in a performing ensemble. And it's something that only really bass players and drummers can truly appreciate because, you know, when you really lock in with your your other half, your better half, so to speak, uh, it, it can be really exciting and transcendent. And uh, yeah, that's that's what it's like to lock in with a drummer. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for tuning in to Question and Answer Time with Adam Neely. If you're listening to this as a podcast on iTunes, be sure to remember to rate and review. Please comment, like, and subscribe. And also consider joining my Patreon because it's the patrons over at my Patreon that make this channel possible. So thank you so much. And until next time, peace.